Hello, everyone, and welcome to the With Chinese Characteristics podcast. I'm Natalie. I'm Cherry. And together, we talk about topics with Chinese characteristics, and it is hot as crap where we are recording today. So,、um, hopefully, we finish this without some piece of equipment like restarting or breaking or something. Oh, it's not that bad. I guess it's not that bad, but it's still really hot. At least we don't live in Seattle or <laughs> whatever, wherever the heat wave is at yeah, right now at, at the, the moment. moment. Um, well, anyway, so today we're going to talk about the McCartney expedition. Which, if you're a fan of imperial Chinese history,、um, aren't we all? Right. Of, Who's、uh, who? Yeah. <laughs> you should be.、Um, and it's basically a trade mission that the UK, the United Kingdom, sent to China in 1792 in order to get a special kind of trade relationship with China. Okay.、Um, And I think it's interesting for a number of reasons, and we're going to talk about it because it's kind of a it kind of ties into colonialism, it ties into trade, it ties into imperial politics, it ties into what would later be the Opium Wars,、uh, it ties into a lot of stuff. Wow,、I、what、know. a little gem of a historical event you found! Yes, it's very much like a nexus that if it had gone differently, history could have gone a different way, possibly.、Mm, okay. So first off, to call Qing Imperial China closed. Is somewhat inaccurate. Oh! In the late 1700s, there was a vibrant sea trade among neighbors, with Chinese trading junks crowding the seas and caravans traveling by land. Armies expanded the frontiers to the north and west. Diplomats reinforced age-old tributary relations with neighbors. There was also an intense international trade with silver coming in from the mines of Central America to buy goods Europeans craved, such as tea, silk, and porcelain.、Hmm. Now we're going to talk about moving forward the, the Canton system, where basically all foreign trade has to go through the port of Canton.、Mm-hmm. Um, well, Modern most, day Guangzhou. Yeah, most European trade rather. But these restrictions were not on Chinese traders. Chinese traders could basically leave from any port,、mm. carrying things, and go to Korea, Thailand, India if they wanted to,、okay. Japan, and and trade and come back. But if you if you originated from a foreign So if you're importing into China, yes, that's the only port you yes, can go through. Yes, if you're、through. a foreign flagship, got it. So like any state, they attempted to control trade, borders, and diplomacy to be, and what they considered to be, in their best interest. For example, access to the emperor was strictly limited in order to enhance his prestige and thus power to govern. As in, like meeting the prime minister, like if could yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, okay, right, of you course, know, yeah. You know, so so these sort of things of like, oh,、Not、just any peasant get yeah, to meet the emperor. Yes. So it's、yeah. not it's not strange, right? We have to remember put into context. Even more than now, China was a huge place compared to the rest of the world.、Mm-hmm. So United Kingdom around this time period is around ten million people total. Okay. China was around three hundred million people. Oh wow! So、okay. more than thirty to one, which is more than the ratio today,、mm-hmm. right? Because right now the UK is like sixty million and China is like one point four billion. So、um, big difference. So in sixteen forty seven. The Qing Dynasty, which had recently taken control of China, from the Ming Dynasty. Yeah, they instituted a sea ban, which is a thing that's happened multiple times throughout Chinese history.、Mm-hmm. You're a Chinese emperor. You have trouble with pirates. Well, what do you do? You destroy the pirates' food. You basically go, "It's illegal. I'm going to outlaw the ocean. Nobody can live <laughs> within 20 miles of the coast. Okay. Nobody can trade. Nobody can fish. And then if there's no one there,、uh-huh. if anybody is At the coast, you know, they we kill them, and、It's, it seems like a very drastic move. <laughs> I mean, very- I, I I know these, these sort of things exist. I didn't know that they happen pretty often. Whenever you have yeah a problem with piracy, they've happened、um, it- multiple times in Chinese history, and sometimes they're localized. So in this one specifically, it was more around the southeast region because there was that breakaway kingdom in Taiwan. Yes. So they're like, well, if no one lives there, if there's no trade, if there's no, then you know, no one can trade with these people. No one can, they can't raid anything for resources. They can't get supplies, and they're cut off. That's interesting. So it will stop all economic activity. Yes. Okay. We'll remove、right. their food source. Okay. Actually, <laughs> and、uh, eventually, though, that was, and and during this time period, foreign trade was still allowed, but only through Macau. So it was very limited. Okay. This was eased after Taiwan was taken back. However, in 1717, due to a large number of Chinese who had left due to repressive Qing policies like the Q, which 
our first episode is on. Mm-hmm. Uh, the famous Emperor Kangxi uh, instituted a second ban and basically was like, all foreign Chinese have to come home within three years. We're again closing all these ports, doing all these things. Because so many Chinese had left to places like Indonesia that he was afraid that they were going to create breakaway kingdoms. Mm. So he's like, you Yeah, know, foresight. Yeah. So he, to what happened today? <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, you know, so that happened again, right? Yeah. Then in the 1720s, foreign trade was opened again to a limited number of ports. Not just Canton. There was a couple of ports up and down the coast that foreigners could trade at. Okay. By the mid-1700s, however, the British began to find these controls increasingly stifling. Throughout the century, English appetite for an addictive consumer drug, tea, had grown alarmingly. By 1784, Parliament had declared the substance a strategic resource, like coal or whatever, that you, we have to keep a year's supply in the country at all times. Yeah. Um, tea, so tea is as important. It's a necessity. It's now. a necessity. We'll die without it. I don't know if they will really die without <laughs> it. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's interesting, though, because if you think about it, right, there's so many, even American history, right? You have the Boston Tea Party. Yeah. And, you know, it seems like a very kind of commonplace thing, but it still is at this time period, this exotic foreign substance that you can only get from china yeah and now tea like i don't know afternoon tea breakfast tea it seems all part of the british tradition yeah when right? the tradition has only started not that long ago not that long ago yeah um you know within a couple all things years. considered yeah so by 1804 the U- united kingdom was shipping back 24 million pounds a year of tea wow okay. which in a population of 11 million that's a couple of pounds of tea per person yeah. per year this tea was paid for primarily in silver, as it was difficult to get merchants in Canton to accept any other item. Um, you, they could technically accept other things, but for the most part, the merchants, you know, they knew they had a, they had a monopoly. Right. So they just wanted silver. While the tea was a great source of revenue for both the Crown and the East India Company, the constant flow of silver into China proved troublesome. Adding to this, the number of ports of, uh, to trade kept diminishing. Crucially, Northern ports such as Ningbo, where the merchants were willing to buy cold weather clothes. So Ningbo? Yeah. Ningbo? Okay. Ningbo is fine. Okay. There was ports in northern China where... So, A. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So, the reason the number of ports kept shutting down is for a couple of reasons. One, the... Supposedly, the Qing government got more tax revenue if all of the stuff was in Canton. Because then you have to move all the goods through China internally... And that all has tariffs and customs on it. And, you know, you have to bring it through the canals um, and they make so more tax So within China, money. it would already generate tax income. Yes. Okay. Right. Whereas if the foreigners go up north and they buy it at the source, then there's less taxes that, gotcha. that the Qing government gets. Also, um, the merchants in Canton, you know, they, they didn't want competition, right? Because if Westerners can shop around, they might get a better deal. Mm-hmm. This way they can, they have a monopoly on it. And three, there was sort of a thought that India was in the process of being colonized. Other places were the, that like, uh, we don't know about these foreigners. Mm. Let's kind of keep an eye on them and keep them in one place. We don't want to be the next India at yeah. this time. And yeah. Right. These ports were shut down. Okay. And basically what it meant was that not only could the English not shop around to get a better price for tea, they also couldn't shop around and see who wanted their their own goods to trade in exchange like for example cold weather clothing right not that useful in canton yeah <laughs> it's a warm place it's a warm place yeah, yeah it's very for, for, warm. for background yeah. yeah so eventually they were locked only canton and it was run by an official who the british felt was corrupt so frustrated the local merchants sent a small expedition to petition the emperor Qinlong, mm-hmm. to restore their access to these northern ports okay and to replace the local official they thought a local official, a Chinese local official, was corrupt. Was corrupt. Okay. Yes, they thought he was corrupt. Uh, led by the only British person we know of at the time who could speak Chinese, this guy named James Flint, who grew up as an orphan in Canton. Mm-hmm. They traveled north, bribed their way past officials. This is not like an official crown expedition. This is like the merchants all in Canton are like, the British merchants are like, this guy is, you know, is, uh, he's, he, he's taking bribes. But yeah. he's asking for more bribes than is customary. Because mm. obviously there's going to be some bribery <laughs> yeah. with the Qing official. He just pushed it too, too, too far. Too far. So yeah. they're like, okay, we, get, we know this guy who speaks Chinese. We'll ask the emperor. And 
<laughs> insanely, yeah. they do actually manage to get to the emperor wow. in the 1750s. That's a big feat. That is a big feat, right? Yeah. So they they get to the emperor. The emperor's like, okay, we'll do it. But, you know, Flint, who's the guy who speaks Chinese, you have to go back with our investigators to mm. accuse the guy in person. Mm. So okay. he goes back. They accuse the guy. He gets fired. They put a new official in charge. But at the same time, the emperor, in his wisdom... Chin Long's like, okay, well, you also broke protocol because you came and bothered me directly. Yeah. So whoever taught you Chinese, we're going to execute him, which no. they did. <laughs> but if he grew up in China, then everyone taught him Chinese. I think he, you know, but you, you know, he, he had, had one teacher. He had like a tutor. Okay. Right. And also um, James Flint was uh, in prison for three years. Oh, no. And though He was eventually released. Okay. And he turns up later, um, 20 or 30 years later. In American history, because he apparently taught Benjamin Franklin how to make tofu. Oh, <laughs> wow. He had quite a journey then. He had quite a life. Now, yeah. uh, access to Chinese was considered something that the Qing was part of their policy for the Qing court. They didn't want foreigners to understand Chinese. They only wanted Chinese translators to understand English. Huh. Okay. Be- because they thought that... They wanted... Did they want to like control the flow of information? Yeah, they don't want people to be able to read Chinese documents, right? They don't want people to, um, you know, it, it's you know, t- they thought it would it made it gave them advantages in trade, and also there was no permanent residence for Europeans. Right. Um, you would go there during the trading season, and then you would either have to go to Macau or go home for okay. for the off season. So how do they ban the learning of Chinese, though? They could only ban it from Chinese people teaching. Yes. So foreigners. if you were a foreigner and you knew Chinese, I mean, there's not that much they can do about it. But right. if you, if a foreigner knew Chinese and they figure out like, oh, this guy was teaching them or yeah. he was always talking to this Chinese guy, then you could can, be in trouble. Can a foreigner teach foreigner Chinese? Yes. Okay. But... The, Just you know, trying to game the system here. Yeah. And, and again, it's one of those things where it's more of a threat. Yeah. Where you go like it would it would try to scare off people in Canton right. from getting too chatty with the foreigners. Right. Not that it would necessarily be that easy to implement, but it shows the attitude. Yes. It shows the, the attitude. Court. And it worked because as we'll talk about. Um, so this set the precedent for dealing with the English. Right. They're profitable. Right, they keep buying our tea, mm-hmm. but they greedily ask for special privileges. How dare! They? How dare they? So simply deal with them fairly, but keep them at arm's reach, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So keep it businesslike. This was not the case for every European nation. French, Italian, Spanish, Russians, and Portuguese had a much longer-running and amicable relationship with China. Oh. Throughout, through Jesuit priests, they even provided advisors to the emperor. They brought Chinese visitors back to Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, uh, Russia could trade at multiple ports. They even could trade inside China. Mm. Um, there's definitely privileges. But the UK, moving towards the 18th century or the 19th century, they were by far the largest trade partner with China at this point. But they also had probably the worst relationship. Why don't we like them? Well, it's not 100% clear, but it seems like it's a couple things. Like, A, the English were rude. Okay. <laughs> they, they, again, they didn't feel like they had to follow Chinese rules. Okay. I think that, you know, you have the East India Company and you have, you know, British merchants who are in places like India where all the Indian people have to be very differential to them, mm. right? And treat them like, you know, I don't know, like gods, basically. Oh, so you're saying like they're used to this... We're the empire. Yes, we're the empire, yeah. right? And you're this little... You're the colony. You're Even the though colony. China's not a colony, but they, yes. were, they, were, they, were see, they saw themselves as a higher... Yes, and there was a certain level of arrogance, authority. Yeah. I think, um, about it. So, and also, again, they thought, because we do so much trade, we should get special privileges, which nobody... Uh, which, you know, other countries did, but you know, they had kind of earned it. Okay. So, so it sounds to me that the, um, the education I've received holds up. About, <laughs> don't, don't trust foreigners. Don't trust foreigners. <laughs> yeah. I so, mean, the, 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 the British Empire, specifically. Yeah, you <laughs> give them an inch, Jerry, they take a mile. <laughs> this, yeah. I mean, we're not even at the beginning of the 100 years of shame yet. No. But so, I guess we're getting there. We're getting there. So eventually these feelings of like, oh, you know, these British feelings... <laughs> these, these these British, British feelings, feelings. <laughs> these colonialist feelings, uh, coalesce into a series of desires 
of stuff they wanted out of China. Yeah. And an embassy was sent in 1792 in an attempt to obtain them. Okay. Now, this was an official embassy, which the Qing court had agreed to receive mm-hmm. through official channels from the King George III, which everyone's favorite king from the Revolutionary War, yeah. to um, Emperor Qianlong. And if you know about the Opium Wars, you'll see how hard it is to get that, right? Because mm-hmm. the entire 19th century, you know, the, the all these foreigners, they want to talk to the emperor. They want to talk to the court. They want to do all this stuff. Yeah. And it's not really almost until like the Boxer Rebellion where mm-hmm. there yeah. basically is no Qing court that they can, they finally kind of just shoot their way in there. Yeah. But this is all very friendly, right? Okay. So, so this is like an official diplomatic trip. This is an official diplomatic trip okay. where they have these desires, which I'll talk about what they want. And this is the McCartney expedition. This is the McCartney about. expedition, okay. 1792. And McCartney is? He's a lord of, he's a British lord. Um, he, you know, he's been a governor of certain places. I think he was an ambassador to Russia. Okay. Uh, interestingly, he is the first one who said in relation to the British Empire, it's an empire on which the sun never sets. Hmm. So he's that guy. Okay. Um, other people said it, obviously, and it's been said about other empires, yeah. like the Spanish, but he's the one who first said it for the UK. Um, he was going to be carried by the HMS Lion, a 64-gun ship of the line, like a battleship, basically. Wow, okay. And the Hindustan, which is an armed merchant vessel with 54 guns. So For a diplomatic trip, this seems he seems very well equipped. Yes, and <laughs> so there's, almost, there's like 600 people going. Uh-huh. And to put it into context... The yeah. ship's going. The the uh, USS Constitution, the pride of the new American government, yeah, which wasn't completed yet, is only going to be forty four guns. So these are some these are some big ships, right, yeah. to be going there. They're bringing up quite literally the big guns. Yeah, bringing the big guns. So wh- why six hundred people? Like, what are, are do they have six hundred diplomats or are they? No, some other... so you got to have the crews for the ship. Yeah. You got to have. You know, he's got like musicians and artists. He's bringing mm. technical advisors. He's okay. bringing all sorts of diplomats. People's kids want to come. <laughs> you know, there's some soldiers coming. Right, right but there's also, is there like a cultural exchange aspect of this? There's a cultural exchange okay. aspect of it too. So because it's supposed to be, you can almost think of it as like a traveling world's fair or something, right? <laughs> the or, circus is in town. Right? Yeah. So he's going to be uh, clad in the most grandiose outfit he could muster. All this, it's almost like if a, uh, when the outfit is described, it's almost like if somebody was dressing up as a Chinese emperor for a Halloween costume, just like all this velvet and ruffles and all this stuff. So he was trying to look as fancy as possible. Is that? Yeah. Okay. And the ships were loaded with gifts for the emperor and examples of English manufacturing. Textiles, luxuries, weapons, machines, scientific apparatus, uh, lots of lenses and glass, and even a hot air balloon. Mm. All were included, as well as scientific and t- technical experts to explain their functions to the Chinese. Oh. So there's like a planetarium. There's all these little globes, so they brought the, the, steam, steam machines, steam. They uh, brought steam the engines. user manual, which were people at yes, this point. Yes, which were people. Because it's like, oh, this is the guy who invented it, right? Yeah. <laughs> So, and the centerpiece was a suitably deferential letter from King George III, which I'll read part of it, which is, His Most Sacred Majesty George III, by grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, and Sovereign of the Seas, Defender of the Faith, <laughs> and so forth, to the Supreme Emperor of China, Qianlong, worthy to live tens of thousands and tens of thousands thousands years yeah sendeth greetings. Yeah. Well, can I just say, I yeah. guess Game of Thrones didn't, didn't actually get... Their, um, insp- George d- did get his inspiration from real history. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, it's like, oh. It's like King the Mother of-, of Dragons was like 10 different titles. And and also, you know, you have <laughs> yeah. King of France, which obviously he wasn't. But it's like, you know, by relation, you know. Yeah. You got to put it in there just in case, right? Yes. You got to yeah. keep it alive. Um, the natural disposition of a great and benevolent sovereign, such as your imperial majesty, whom providence has seated upon a throne for the good of mankind, is to wow. watch over the peace and security of his dominions and to take pains for disseminating happiness, virtue, and knowledge among his subjects, extending also the same bene- beneficence with all the peaceful arts as far as he is able to the whole human race. And then it goes on and on and on. That's a, that's a big hat. It's to... a big hat. <laughs> it's a very deferential letter. Yeah. You know, and it, it apparently when it was translated into Chinese, mm-hmm. the people who translated it, they made it even more deferential because no, they're like, okay, they you got to write the emperor's name really big here. And, you yeah. know, there's all these like special rules. 
So he takes care to say in this letter, they're not interested in making money, gaining territory, but simply to learn from each other and share wisdom. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure, right? <laughs> However, beneath the flowery language, he asks for a few things. Travel for British nationals, including missionaries, mm -hmm. residents for British nationals, and also fair, quote unquote, access to Chinese markets. Um, mm. There's an addition, a more direct list of desires from McCartney, which he presented you know, on a side, which I'll summarize as they want more ports to trade in. They want permanent presence in Peking, at like an embassy. Uh, they want an island mm. to put a trade base on, and they want lower taxes for British imports. So there is, they do that, want territory. That's, that's pretty big demands. Yeah, they, they do want territory, and they do want to make money. Yeah, they so, specified what territory. Yes. An island. In <laughs> They're like, we could use yeah. a little island, maybe this one or that one, right? Yeah. And, they, and they named them. So... So this was jointly financed by the East India Company, which is the company that basically did all the colonialism in this yeah. in this era. Yes. Uh, eventually, it was nationalized after the uh, Indian Mutiny, the Indian Rebellion. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it's technically a separate company. But they actually didn't want to do it anymore because by the 1790s, trade with China was going better. They were building up a better relationship with the merchants in Canton. They were selling more of their goods mm. to these people from, because from India, from you know, from factories in the United Kingdom and also from India, wherever okay. else. Because if you think about it, right, if you're trading things to Canton, you know, it's going to take some time for the people in Canton to find markets yeah. in North China, wherever these, you know, clothing and stuff should go. So back in the days, things move a bit slower. Yeah. So yeah. they're thinking, you know, it's going pretty well. Um, we don't really want to offend the emperor because you never know, right, how these things go. Yeah. And it could set our progress back. But there's a lot of people in the UK, there's merchants, there's factory owners who are like, no, no, there's a big market in China. This is like, mm. just like today, <laughs> they're yeah. like, they're like, do you know how many Chinese people there are? Like, <laughs> we got to sell them more stuff. Yeah. So the, the mission went ahead anyway. Beyond diplomacy and profits, this wouldn't be an opportunity for British warships to map the Chinese coastline, mm. po rivers, ports, and other features for any future activities. Indeed, there was a martial bent for the expedition from the gifts, which a lot of them were gun, which a lot of them were military in nature, mm -hmm. to the 120 guns of the vessels carrying the expedition, to the soldiers and other things. Okay. So... Up until this point, the British had no maps of the Chinese coastline um, north of like basically like Nanjing. Right. Um, so they're like, oh, while we're there, we'll take a look around. There was, however, a problem. No one, as far as they could tell, in the entire British Empire spoke Chinese. <laughs> well, they're not allowed to be taught Chinese. They're not allowed to be taught Chinese. And James Flint had died. They couldn't find one person? They could not find one person. I'm sure they could. Okay. They tried. Okay. So they're like... Well, what about the rest of Europe? So they're like, well, I think the Catholic Church has brought over Chinese people, Chinese scholars, uh -huh. to curate their their archive of Chinese literature, mm. which they had they, apparently they had. So eventually, they found some Chinese speakers in Naples, which is in Italy, yeah. who the Jesuits had brought had converted and brought back to the Europe with them. Okay, and two of them wanted to go home, <laughs> so. They joined the expedition. Okay. So they spoke Chinese. So they come over of children. Now they're like in their early 30s, I think. Right. One of them's like in his 50s. Okay. The journey took 10 months. And as they drew closer, the seas began to fill with Chinese merchant vessels going back and forth up and down the South China Sea, mm -hmm. which, you know, China had a lot of trade yeah. just with other countries in the region. So that uh, must be encouraging to see that China is indeed open to trade. Yeah. Just right? not too... Uh, outrageous un un demands <laughs> Unrestricted British trade <laughs> Yes So every port they stopped at Had progressively larger Chinese trading enclaves mm. Like for example Jakarta Which is in Indonesia And you know Other places they'd stop at they'd, They would all have little uh, Areas of town And the cities With lots of Chinese merchants in them So the magnitude Of the merchant traffic And wealth on display Began to worry McCartney As did rumors preceding them Of the vast wealth He was bringing because hmm. everyone was like, oh, yeah, the emperor is excited to see you. You know, we hear that you're bringing like all these piles of gold or whatever else. <laughs> He's like, no. He's like, oh, crap. Yeah. So he began commandeering or buying private items from other members of the expedition in order to add to the gift pile. Right. So he even like, he's like, oh, crap, I have to give a personal gift to the emperor. Yeah. So he like bought some guys watches, okay. you know, and, and stuff like that. 
So now he feels like he can't under deliver. Yeah, he can't under deliver. He's like, yeah. this has got to go well. I mean, it, t- it takes a year to get there. Right. Right. That's a that's a big, big commitment. Time. Yeah. yeah, big commitment. So they reach Macau. One of the interpreters uh, flees because he's like, I'm Chinese. If they figure out I've been I've been in Europe for the past 30 years. Oh, no. They're going to execute me. Yeah. So he flees. The younger one is like, I'm just going to dress in European clothes and carry a sword. <laughs> And yeah. uh, no one's going to know I'm Chinese. So, Like, does he have Italian citizenship at that point? I mean, there's not really the kind of the equivalent of, of citizenship. citizenship. Yeah. But I mean, it doesn't matter, right? right. They're going to go, you're Chinese, right? So he became, his surname was Lee, which I guess means plum in Chinese. Like the fruit, plum. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. So he became Mr. Plum. He, Lee, okay. <laughs> Lee is a, it's a famous, a common last name. Yeah, so he's that like, I am plum. Uh, Mr. Plum, the, you know, okay. the British guy. And other Chinese-speaking Europeans join them. Okay. So, like, mo- again, like, mostly priests. Okay. I who, thought they couldn't find anyone. Well, those were in Europe. Okay. And those were British people. Okay. So, most of the priests in the in China are oh, Catholic. Oh, really speak. Okay, got They're it. They're Catholic. Catholic. Yeah, got it. So, okay. they wanted to join because the Emperor Qianlong and multiple Chinese emperors kept courts of European advisors. Yeah. And but once you join those advisors, you couldn't leave. You have to wear Chinese clothing and follow Chinese laws. Right. Basically, the equivalent of like the guys that uh, Chinese state media, the white people, Chinese state media has now. I think they're allowed to like leave, the, though. They do like the New Year's. Yeah. Uh, New Year's uh, special. I think they're allowed to leave, though. I don't <laughs> Maybe know. they are. Yeah. <laughs> so some of them join because they want to get added to that crew, I guess. Hmm. Um, So I'm going to be adding in some details now that we're in China from the personal account of Lord McCartney's valet. So like his, you know, one of his servants. His name is Aeneas Anderson, and he wrote a book called A Narrative of the British Embassy to China in the year 1792, 1793 and 1794, (laughs) containing the various circumstances of the embassy with accounts of customs and manners of the Chinese and description of the towns, countries, cities, etc. Now, this one's interesting because... So McCartney has his own account, which he wrote, which I'm is sure. mostly about the the diplomatic stuff. Right. And it's kind of designed to make everything look like in his own best interest. Of course. But Aeneas is just some guy on the expedition. He doesn't know what McCartney's talking about the emperor. So he's mostly just kind of writing stuff down, what he sees. Mm. And it's I feel like it's it's pretty entertaining. And I might read some more from him at the end. So you think he will be a bit more objective about the British Empire's motives and... Yeah, and And also why the embassy failed. Right, okay. So before landing, McCartney gives a speech to the everybody of like, we got to be on our best behavior. And I feel like this is illuminating because it shows that they're conscious of how they're viewed. Yeah. So this is from Aeneas' account, but he says, it is impossible that the various important objects of the embassy can be obtained, but through the goodwill of the Chinese. That Mm. goodwill may depend on the ideas which they shall be induced to entertain of the disposition and conduct of the English nation. Mm. And they can judge only from the behavior of the majority of those who come amongst them. So us. So us, right? It must be confessed that the impressions hitherto made upon their minds in consequence of the irregularities committed by Englishmen at Canton are unfavorable even to the degree of considering them the worst among Europeans. So when he says a consequence of the irregularities committed by Englishmen at Canton, he yeah. means English people are very badly behaved in Canton. Oh, okay. Maybe they're trying to cheat Chinese people or, you know, they get in fights with them or, or whatever they do. Um, irregularities. These irregularities <laughs> made yeah. us, make us the most unfavorable amongst all Europeans. Okay. Therefore, these impressions are communicated to that tribunal in the capital which reports to and advises the emperor upon all concerns with foreign countries. It is therefore essential by conduct particularly regular and circumspect to impress them with a new, more just, and more favorable idea of Englishmen. (laughs) And And to show that, even to the lowest officer in the sea or land service or in the civil line, they are capable of maintaining by example and by discipline do order sobriety and subordination amongst their respective inferiors. So it's basically like we're rebranding. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, we're the new fun English people, you know, and we're going to follow all the Chinese rules and we're going to be very respectful. Mm. And maybe they'll forget about the fact that we've been super rowdy 
They'll be Canton. impressed by this new, yes. new brand of British New manners. brand of British manners. So therefore, the people in China, uh, it says, though the people in China have not the smallest share in the government, yet it is a maxim uh, invariably pursued with their superiors to support the meanest Chinese in any difference with a stranger, and if occasion should happen, to avenge his blood, of which indeed... So basically saying, like, we also have to be careful because if a Chinese person is injured or killed or something happens... The Chinese government will always essentially back the, the Chinese, the Chinese, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, is not that odd, right? I mean, the British government mostly does the same thing. Yeah. So uh, they're like, we got to really be on our, our toes here. And he basically was like, because it's there's been situations happen where, for example, um, a Chinese person was killed and in Canton, and the Chinese government's like an eye for an eye. We got to kill the guy who killed him. Right. McCartney's like, if that happens, you're on your own. I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna <laughs> we're gonna I'm, give you to them. Yeah, I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna let them kill you because <laughs> yeah. you know. So you know, be on your best behavior. <laughs> so they stop in Tianjin. They exchange formalities, which is a city on the coast by Beijing. Yeah. They exchange format. Beijing and Peking are the same place. It's just Peking is uh, the older um, pronunciation. Um, so I might call it Beijing by accident, but in the context of this, it's Peking. The capital. Uh, the capital. So the Chinese are gracious hosts. They offload the expedition into, and their gifts into a series of junks, uh, assign them a mandarin to smooth their journey, and they give them plenty of food and water. Assign them a mandarin? Yeah. Like, like, a, like a Chinese person? Yeah, official. Oh, right? okay. Because they're going to be traveling up the river, so they put somebody suitably high-ranking with right. the expedition, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure they have yeah. food and, you know. So. Uh, okay. So this is an official deal, right? Um, Aeneas says that the food takes some getting adjusting to, uh, <laughs> instead of bread, they have, uh, rice and mantel, which is like, uh, steamed buns, kind of like bread buns. Yeah. Like rolls. Chinese bread. Chinese, Chinese bread. Steamed rolls. Yes. And, um, which he found it necessary to cut into slices and toast before he could reconcile it to his appetite. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, the rice liquor was harsh and sharp and in short has more of a taste of vinegar than wine. Mm. Though later they got better baiju. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming he's talking about baiju or yeah. rice wine. Mm -hmm. um, he spends a lot of time describing the buildings, the food, the clothes, the people. Because it takes weeks to get up the river to, to Beijing. Yeah, um, it's a long journey. Some of it is they're literally being pulled up the river yeah. by people with ropes. So he's really like getting a hands-on experience. He's getting a hands-on experience. It seems like he has a lot of time to observe. You know, there's, you know, he explains like, you know, these Chinese people, he says... The only method these people have of conveying their meat to the mouth is by small pointed lengths of wood or ivory <laughs> in the form of pencils. It is absolutely necessary, therefore, that their food be cut into small pieces. So, you know, very like, you, know, you won't believe this, but they, yeah. don't have, they don't have forks in China. Yeah. I was there. You can, you can hear from me. <laughs> so he, or it, knives to cut or their knives, food themselves. Right? No, at, yeah. the, at the table, no knives. So yeah, he writes on a lot of stuff. He talks. We're civilized people. Sorry, just I'm <laughs> clearly cherry. You're not carrying knives everywhere. Yeah, like barbarians. I know British people. <laughs> he is marvels at the size of everything, the scale, the constant cannon salutes as they travel up the river. Mm. The food, the women, the culture, how people are dressed. The food, the women, the culture. Well, okay. He he. He, every time he goes to a new area of China, yeah. he does, he does, I mean, you know, he does seem to like the ladies and he mentions like what the ladies look like. Yeah, like. just let's try out the local flavors, yeah. just like the food. And, and the primary thing he seems interested in is like, yeah. oh, do these women have their foot pound? Bind oh, those yeah. women, mm -hmm. right? So he's like, okay, Northern China going up to Beijing, the feet are, feet are bound. Yeah. In Beijing, not bound. So if they, he would go to Kanto, he would find that they're not bound. Yeah. Which yeah, he later mostly. does. Yeah. So this is really the only time the British would be invited into the empire en masse as friends and guests rather okay. than interlopers and invaders. Right. Um, not yet anyways. Not yet, right? So this is an interesting perspective because it's still the Qing empire is very healthy, right? More or less, right? It's kind of getting on the downslope, but it's, mm. you know, it's still vibrant. Mm -hmm. They're not there to invade. They're there as friends um, and they haven't forced their way in. It's a very... Well, they're only there to ask for an free island. Yes. But, but no, you know, not here to invade. Not here to invade yet. So eventually they reach Beijing. Aeneas, you know, has more observations. But he does say that they look really terrible, that their clothes, maybe after a year of travel, have really 
don't they don't look that good themselves they don't look that okay. yeah themselves so he says he talking about chinese people who see them traveling he says for they no sooner ob- obtained a sight of any of us than they universally burst out into loud shouts of laughter and i must acknowledge that we did not at this time wear the appearance of people who were arrived in this country in order to obtain by every mean of address and proposition those commercial privileges and political distinctions with no other nation has had the art or power to accomplish. So, so he's like, we need new clothes. We're yeah, not dressing like, the part. He's like, we look like crap. Yeah. We're coming here to ask for something that nobody else has gotten. And Chinese people literally start laughing when they see us because we look so bedraggled. So are they going to get new clothes? No, it's going to, they're going to look terrible the whole time. He oh, mentions no. like four or five times that they look like clowns <laughs> or, or like, or like poppers or you know, <laughs> yeah. like homeless people. The second thing is that the expedition did not truly seem to respect the sovereignty of the Chinese. Mm. Almost seemed oh, really? to view it as a second. Yeah. Can you believe it, Cherry, mm-hmm. that these British, these British members of the you know, East India Company and British lords do not respect I mean, the re- sovereignty? I mean, represented by, uh, by McCartney. Yeah. Who, uh, sound never sound, uh, sound, yes. sound never sets. So, and yeah. they, there's, there's a couple of times where they essentially get into fights or shouting matches with Chinese guards. For example, they want to go visit, I think, the Forbidden Palace. And the guard... What, they think it's a park? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's in the name, guys. It's the Forbidden Palace. <laughs> yeah. And the guards won't let them in, and they're, like, fighting with the guards. And, and Aeneas writes down in his accounts, like, maybe it's not a good idea to, like, be mean to these people who are just doing their job. What right? if a Chinese person just went, or whatever, a Chinese official just went to... London pa- and Buckingham Palace, re- you know, demanded to walk into Buckingham Palace. Yes. And that's what Aeneas says. He's like, you know, yeah, we don't, you know, so, but then they drop off most of the, they drop off most of the scientific equipment, most of the larger items, the gifts, um, not all the gifts, but mm-hmm. so part of it is the cultural exchange. So they basically, they get a hall, um, near, I think it's not fully in, but like near the, the palace. Okay. And they leave all the scientists there and the artists to like set up all these displays and, you know, the little steam engines and whatever else. Okay. And uh, the idea is they're going to go on to the emperor's palace in Jeho, which is uh, to the north, past the, past the Great Wall, past the mountains north of Beijing. Okay. And then the emperor is going to come back afterwards with them and they're going to show them all of their little science fair experiments. Okay. So this is, though, where things start to get fully go wrong for the expedition so first off they get to they pass the great wall everyone's impressed they they get to jehol which and um they're supposed to be met supposedly Uh by some office called the grand chula which is referenced in all their accounts and they're like where's the grand chula the grand chula is supposed to meet us here and apparently there is no such thing as a grand chula yeah i've never heard of that it's not clear who why they think there's an office called the grand chula apparently it took 50 years for Europeans to realize there's no such thing as a Grand Chula. Okay. But the guy that they're actually waiting for is the Manchu Minister of State. Okay. Um, yeah. But anyway, so they wait outside for like six or seven hours and eventually they give up and McCartney just has to go find the guy that they're supposed to meet. Okay. Well, wait, they wait outside where? Like they're lodging because they're supposed to be like, you know, because they, they get there. Yeah. So it's... The British find it hard to understand that while this is an official expedition, to a certain extent, they're just not really that important. <laughs> the, 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 you know what I mean? Emperor Chin Long, you know, he probably gets, you know, a, a dozen, you know, missions per week, right? From, yeah. from Japan, from Korea, from, you know, Thailand, from all these different places, from different so, Mongol tribes, from Tibet. Right. And so it's like they arrive to, to Jehol with like all these musicians and in the ceremony and then they all line up and they're just waiting. Like Ready someone for the red carpet to roll out. the red carpet to roll okay. out and some <laughs> official to be like, oh, we're so glad you're here, right? Yeah. You know, like... But no one's there to no receive No one's there, them. right? It's like they're checking in at like a holiday <laughs> inn, right? <laughs> yeah. And so they're hitting the little bell on the desk, right? Okay. <laughs> so... Then uh, they get there, they get ready to go see the emperor. There's some initial exchange of presents and stuff. Mm-hmm. And the Chinese, uh, the Qing court, very generous. They give all these silks and, you know, all this stuff. Mm. And, um, you know, there's the British have their stuff that they're giving back. And that's all going fine. Um, but then there's the issue of the kowtow, which is probably uh, the most famous thing about this, this expedition, which yeah. is, so if you're going to meet the emperor of yeah. china mm-hmm. the son of heaven yeah the you know the chosen one the chosen one 
the um who's gonna live ten thousand years you said, yeah yeah chen long's 85 so he's yeah. and he's been emperor like 50 years yeah um he's used to a certain level of level of respect and custom yes <laughs> and to a certain extent you're the emperor part of your role is ceremonial right yeah and so if you want to if you want to formally address the emperor your expedition you got to do the whole kowtow yeah. ceremony which, which is, is the kneeling down and then like you bow uh, and hit you, your uh, forehead to the ground uh, yeah. a certain number of times I believe. yeah and then yeah. you move forward and you nine. maybe do it a couple more times yeah. and you know so it's this it's this thing yeah and um mccartney apparently claims that he rode ahead and some manchu official ching officials like no you don't have to do the kowtow but no, obviously, no Qing official would dare to claim that. I know. Does he want to lose his head? I know. So, or maybe they told him that. <laughs> yeah. And they're just like, well, they're going to be moving down the road and I'm not going to have to deal with them. Right. right. Yeah. So they get there and they're like, no, no, you're going to have to kowtow the emperor. He's the emperor. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, McCartney's like, well, I'm not going to kowtow the emperor. They're like, um, he's like they're like he's like, like i you're wouldn't, not meeting him I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't kowtow king george yeah so why would i kowtow the emperor yeah and they're like well king george isn't the chinese emperor yeah the chinese whatever custom you have yeah you're here we in don't china care. Yeah. you kowtow and he's like well i'll do it if a ching high official <laughs> kowtows this picture of king george that, <laughs> that i brought I with me <laughs> i know I, I know that story yeah i yeah. brought with me he's like i'll put it in the chair here yeah and make it kowtow that <laughs> Then I'll go kowtow the emperor. <laughs> and they're like... The Chinese are like, what? No, they're like, they're like, this is stupid. So then, <laughs> so then King George is like, okay, then, then McCartney's like, okay, fine. I will bow to him as if he was King George. I will do the same <laughs> ceremony, the kneeling and a bow, whatever, yeah. as I would to King George. Yeah. So he's like, I am not going to respect. I am not going to The King George the is my king. And the officials yeah. are like... They're, they're like, it's just a little meaningless ceremony, right? You do it and then we'll just move on, right? Yeah. And it's all fun and games after that, right? <laughs> yeah. You just got to do it once. And he's like, no. <laughs> so then they're like, fine. You can just kneel and bow to him. Mm-hmm. So, but, so and, and McCartney goes, he thinks it's a win. He goes, oh, great. I won here. <laughs> I didn't have to kowtow. Yeah. When, other, when Chinese people hear and other European nations hear that I'm the only one yeah. Did not have to kowtow to the emperor. It's going to make us look really good. Well, we are the empire after yes. all. Well, yeah. one thing to notice is the Qing accounts, from what I could tell, just say that he kowtowed to the emperor, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know. So anyway. Well, is there, is there going to be an argument? Oh. Where we're like, let's put it to the record. He says and he says. Yeah. McCartney's like, I did not. Yeah. And well, like, McCartney's like, well, I <laughs> did not. Yeah. And, um, but so he thinks, okay, that went well. And then... um. <laughs> Uh, there's another, but it did not go well. So there's another incident where a soldier was whipped for drunkenness and basically uh, British a British soldier. So they just string him up and I think they give him like 60 lashes um, because he bought booze off a local Chinese person and got super drunk. Okay. And so they're whipping him on the edge of the, the camp, right? The city. Okay. And all the mandarins and all the Chinese officials are coming out to watch. Yes. And they're well, like, when we say Mandarin, do you just mean like Chinese people, or you no, mean, I mean man- officials? That's a official. Name. Mandarins are it means a court official. Oh, okay. Like a Mandarin of the fourth rank. I did not know that. Yeah, it just is like the the term. Okay, just making sure. It's like, we're, like a civil yeah. servant, basically. Uh, okay. So this is what Aeneas writes of it: the Mandarins, as well as those of the inferior classes who were present, expressed their abhorrence at this proceeding. Hmm. While some of them declared that they could not reconcile this conduct in a people who professed a religion which they represented to be superior to all others in enforcing sentiments of benevolence and blending the duties of justice and mercy. True. On the princip- one of the principal Mandarins, who knew a little of the English language, expressed his own sentiments and thus of his brethren by saying, Englishmen too much cruel, too much bad. So they're whipping <laughs> this guy, yeah. you know, with his back all bloody, um, you know, within the city. And not like the Chinese don't do horrible punishments. Well, but- so the British... Officials are yeah, whipping the, the British soldiers. The British are, are whipping the British okay. soldiers. self yeah. administered punishment. And I think they thought this is going to make them realize we're really strict about discipline. Yeah. But really... When they I, just thought they were cruel and silly. And it's not like the, the, the Qing court didn't do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I think part of it is also like... You're in the imperial like villa. Yeah. And you're just like whipping a guy to death. Yeah. It's not really the place for it. it also, it's not your law. Yeah, you know? it's not your law. It's not a place where you can apply your law. 
Yes. And it's disrupting, you know, everybody's good time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Relaxing here. On the broad daylight. Yes, on the broad yeah. daylight. Okay. So, so that did not leave a good impression. That did not leave a good impression. Also, disease was a serious problem. Okay. Uh, members of the expedition kept dying. Oh, um, of like a lot of them, it's the bloody flux, which is probably either cholera or dysentery. Okay. Basically means like bloody diarrhea. Right. I and mean, they have gone through long times of travel and they have gone through a long time of travel, but you know, the Qing court definitely noticed this. I mean, Chen Long's 85, <laughs> right? So you're like, <laughs> he's like, I'm fine. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> like, you're also like, maybe we don't want, don't want these people around here. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, he's like yeah, disease ridden barbarians. Yeah. They're like, they're like. They're like beating their own soldiers to death in the courtyard. <laughs> like they're giving us all these guns, right? I mean, can I just, <laughs> from yeah. their perspective, if you put all those together, yeah. maybe when they call it the British barbarians, maybe they had their reasons. Right, they have their reasons, right? <laughs> they got all these crazy. Maybe the, maybe when the Qing Empire thought they were superior, yeah, they had a good evidence. They have all these crazy, the ass, these crazy beards, you know. <laughs> so, so then it's time to actually meet the emperor. Okay. Right now that the whole ceremony kowtow thing had been uh, determined. Time for business. Time for business. But this also was a mess because, again, the British embassy didn't really seem to realize they weren't that important. Mm. So they're like, you know, so it's kind of like, okay, Shenlong's got a busy day. You want to meet him. You got to be ready to go at 4 a.m. That's the <laughs> slot, right? <laughs> That's your appointment time. It's like, it's like you're like you're want to be an extra on The Price is Right or like a game right. show, right? They're like, right. okay, everybody line up. Yeah. You know, this, we're starting filming at seven. You got to be out there like at one. Yeah, yeah. So they, got, they have a schedule to they keep. They have a schedule. China's a big country. But yeah, but they, they didn't got, seem to get this. They've got a this. big country to manage. So they're like, oh, well, we got we got the musicians. We got this whole thing. We're going to do a parade. Oh. <laughs> so they line up yeah. at 4 a.m. to do the parade. Oh, and they're like, well, there will be no parade. Well, no. <laughs> They think there's going to be a parade. I know, but then the Chinese officials go, there will be no parade. No, reality had a way of asserting itself. So okay. this is what Aeneas wrote in his journal. Though the morning was so dark that we could not distinguish each other, Lieutenant Colonel Benfin made an attempt to form a procession to precede the palanquin of the ambassador. But this maneuver was of a very short duration, as the bearers of it moved too fast for the solemnity of a, of a slow march. And instead of proceeding it with a grave pace, we were glad to follow it with a quick one. So the ambassador is being carried in a sedan chair mm -hmm. by porters. I think Chinese porters. Yeah. And they just run off with him. <laughs> right? They're like, we're going to get him yeah. there. So yeah. there's all these musicians and <laughs> yeah. all these things that they're like trying to like do, 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 like do a parade behind him. <laughs> so they all have to sprint. <laughs> this is in the dark. <laughs> so they all have to sprint after him. Right? So they're all sprinting. <laughs> <laughs> They're so, like, what are these Chinese people in a rush yeah. for? <laughs> and then he says, indeed, whether it was the attraction of our music or an accidental circumstance, I know not. But we found ourselves intermingled with a cohort of pigs, asses, and dogs, huh? which broke our ranks such as they were and put us into irrecoverable confusion. So they're in the dark, playing music, chasing after the sedan chair, and all these wild, like all these domestic animals come. We're running after them. Yeah, we're curious of like, what's this noise? <laughs> and so they run into them in the dark, and they're all tripping over all these animals because it's still four a.m. Right. Right. So they and then so they're in irre irrecoverable confusion. All formality of procession, therefore, was at an end, and the ambassador's palanquin was too far advanced before us to make a little smart running necessary to overtake it. <laughs> so basically they get there, they're in confusion and then they have to go home. And then he says, in short, it appeared to the greater part of those who were concerned in it to be rather ridiculous to attempt to make a parade that no one could see. Ex yeah. So they're like, they're like, why did we do this at 4 a.m., right? In the, in the dark. No one asked you to. No one asked him to. <laughs> so McCartney seemed to think after he meets the emperor, he, you know, they exchange some pleasantries. He gives them King George's letter. Yeah. Uh, he seems to think the negotiation went well. The emperor even gave a small gift to the 12 year old son of one of the expedition's leaders mm. who had learned a few words of Chinese during the trip. Mm. Who so, taught him they need to be executed. I think he just picked that. It's like, I'm oh, joking. hello. And yeah, like yeah. shishi or whatever. Okay. So he gave him like, like a little, like a, I think like a little that, purse oh, of his belt. Yeah. Yeah. So they were told to leave uh, Jeho and the emperor followed them back. They, they had to leave ahead of schedule. Okay. And they're thinking like, and they, they got some excuse like, well, it's going to get cold. You know, the emperor wants to go back too. Hmm. So they went back and um, the emperor followed them back, briefly touring their scientific demonstrations, hmm. which he declared them fit to amuse children. <laughs> 
Um, but then without warning, uh-huh. to the British at least, yeah. the empire, the emperor ordered the entire expedition to leave within a few days, mm. far ahead of schedule. Mm. So they're supposed to be there for weeks more. Okay. And McCartney had hoped, we're going to be here all winter. Yeah. Right? Because we're going to be friends. Um, they frantically packed their things into boxes and vacated the city. Why did he ask them to leave so early? Well, they began to realize this expedition may not have been successful. Oh. So it had gone very badly. First, Emperor Qinlong had been fully aware of McCartney's arguing over ritual and the bowels and the cow town and everything mm. else. So oh, no. yeah. traveling only over a year, only to waste time, from his perspective, minor matters of ceremony confirmed his view of the British as troublesome. From that point yeah. on, he had already decided to only give them the basic agreed upon courtesies and make their stay as short as possible. Hmm. So he knew, and they're like, and like, you know, obviously he doesn't want to have them come and then like they argue out on the carpet whether or not he's going to bow. Yeah. So he's like, you know what? It's fine. Let's just get this over with. Yeah. When, when he <laughs> get realizes, him out of here. get him out of here. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't like these people. Yeah. He's like, they can, they can keep the presents I'm giving them, which, you know, he gave them lots of stuff. And, uh, but... Well, at that point, you know, China's a rich country. Yes. Yeah. Because originally, apparently, he had thought, oh, they can stay for a couple of weeks. You know, they can see the how beautiful it is out here in, this, in the countryside. You know, they can ride around the horses. We'll make friends. Yeah. But then he's like, these people are paid. <laughs> so he wrote in his diary, when foreigners who come seeking audience with me are sincere and submissive, then I always treat them with kindness. Hmm. But if they come in arrogance, they get nothing. They so, might have... Indeed, come in arrogance. They did come in arrogance, yeah. right? This, alongside the disease, it was so bad that the British ended up even hiding at least one dead body as they were packing. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? Like a guy died while they were packing, and they just like to shove him in the cart, right? Oh, so they they're thought, like, let, let, don't let them know. Like, yeah, another that more one people died. are dying, right? Oh my god! Okay. Uh, and they buried him on the road on the way back. Um, this meant that the ambitious goals of the mission went completely unfulfilled. Right. Chen Long ex- essentially said that they should count themselves lucky they get to keep their gifts and that he wasn't taking away their existing privileges. And their head. And their head. <laughs> so there's these two letters back and forth. Um, but I want to talk about um, fun- McCartney and the British mm-hmm. fundamentally did not understand the nature of what this visit was. Yeah. And I'm going to make an analogy. But to Chen Long and to the Chinese court, this was not like a high stakes business meeting. It was more like inviting a contractor or a client to your Christmas party. Yeah. You know, you come, you give each other presents, you have small talk. It's not the head of the state coming. It's not King George. But even if it was King George, right? Yeah. The point of this situation in Jehol, the gifts, right, is to build a bond. Right. Right. It's not to hash out a contract. Or to give you an island. Or to give you an island. Yeah. Right. You send your representatives, they give the emperor gifts, the emperor gives you gifts. Mm. You like each other, and then down the line, you know, maybe you get what you want. Right. Right? So um, you gotta you play the game. It's, you, this is not a negotiation. No, this part is not, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. This is, let's be friends. And by treating it like a, a business deal, and also by being annoying on matters of protocol, mm. it seemed that it really kind of alienated the the court because yeah. they're like this is like the christmas party right yeah and like why are you coming in here and asking for all this stuff right right and that's kind of how in its ideal state that's how chinese imperial diplomacy is supposed to work mm. you're from korea you're from vietnam you're from japan you come you bow to the emperor even if you don't necessarily think that china is better than korea or japan or whatever else mm-hmm. you just do it yeah and you give him the gifts he gives you gifts and then you then build upon that mm. with the actual negotiation or whatever you want, right? Or yeah. the emperor, like, you know, or it's like Santa Claus. The emperor is like, I know you wanted that thing, you know, and I, so I'm going to give you that island or whatever you wanted, right? Because you seem like nice people. You've done well this past year. Yes. You yeah. don't ask the emperor for things. You just make the emperor happy. And then the emperor gives you what you want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the McCartney and these British people. They're just walking in here demanding. Yeah, they're like, we want this, that, and they don't even want to count though to him. Yeah. (laughs) So they give him. So so they so uh, it even is worse than that because they give him King George's letter, and also McCartney sort of mentions during their meeting the stuff he wants, Mm. and Cheng Long gives back a very formal letter that's like, nah, let's just keep stuff how it is, right? right? Mm -hmm. And then McCartney 
didn't seem to get the hint or it, he might not even have read the first letter, but he sent like a more direct letter saying like, oh, well, um, Mr. Emperor, these are the 10 things we actually want. And then the emperor wrote a more annoyed second letter <laughs> back, which yeah. he handed to the, well, he did personally, but the Qing government handed to the British as mm -hmm. they were being shoved out on the last day, right. which is basically like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, <laughs> no to all the demands. No to all the demands. And here's why. Yeah. Because you're rude and, yes. <laughs> so, and unpleasant. Um, so here's some high points of the letters. Okay. So he says, so basically the British, one of the things they say is, oh, well, you know, we have all this wealth, we have all this technology, all this trade. Yeah. It's going to make you wealthy. And this is the letter from Qianlong. This the is emperor the emperor for Qianlong. McCartney. Yes. Okay. He says, strange and costly objects do not interest me. <laughs> um, he accepted the gifts given yeah. only to be polite. Uh, in fact, there is some evidence that the Qing were rather confused that a pacifist religion, supposedly pacifist, was giving them so many weapons. Because there's all these like <laughs> pistols. He and, has a good point. Yeah, they're yeah. like, oh, check out these new cannons we just made in England, right? And, yeah. and pistols and, and guns. And he's like... I didn't know God was so 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 into war. Yeah, because all of his uh, European advisors, yeah. they're all like French and Italian and stuff. They're all priests. Yeah. And he's like, I thought these guys were supposed to be pacifists. Well, maybe what's the Church of England is different. <laughs> maybe... <laughs> It's like, what's with all these guns? Um, <laughs> yeah. So he gives an inventory mm -hmm. of the gifts he has given the expedition. And he's like, he's like, I gave everybody presents, even all 600, even the people who didn't get to come onto mainland China. Even he, the 12-year-old song of... Yes. Uh, and he's yeah. like, I've enclosed a list of what was given, yeah. which the implication is he thinks McCartney is going to steal the gifts. So, <laughs> So he's like, oh, he so did he, not think much of a McCartney. Yeah, so he's yeah. like, I've enclosed the list of what I've sent. I right? want to, them to get what, yeah. To make sure you get it. And he even yeah. is like, I think that. And he's like, you know, I think you're a better person, this McCartney guy. You probably don't even know all this stuff that he's asking for. Right. So, right? so this, this is addressed to King. This is addressed to King George. Yeah. Yeah. So it's also no, 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 no. But it's also like, hey, this is what your guy was asking for. Like, yeah. Did why, you know? <laughs> why don't you get your, why don't you get, get your subjects in line here? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Get your housing order. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, not let this reflect poorly on you, but you know, you got to get this under control. Um, when they request for the island, he says, every inch of the territory of our empire is marked on the map and the strictest vigilance is exercised over it all. Even tiny islets and far, far lying sandbanks are clearly defined as part of the provinces to which they belong. Mm -hmm. Suppose that other nations were to imitate your evil example and beseech me to present them each and all with a site for trading purposes. How could I possibly comply? That's a good point. Which is what eventually happened. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? I mean, um, history, I guess, question. The, um, is the British? I mean, I guess they're empiring all over the world. Yeah. So they're taking up people's territories as colonies. Yeah. But do they have, are there other instances, cases where they ask for a, I guess, a country with a governing power, central government? And asking for their territory? territory? Uh, no, I mean, it is on a bit... Lease or on... No, I mean, it is a bit... I mean, like, for example, the I mean, United Kingdom's trade is with... They trade with America. They trade with France. They trade with Germany. It's like, they don't get a town in yeah. France, right? Yeah. Um, so, and part of it is, like, there are restrictions, right? For example, you can't stay permanently in Canton, right? You can't travel. But, I mean... That's their decision to make. One of the strategies that the British Empire had, mm -hmm. which kind of became more developed over time to co colonize a place is you get a port city, you build factories there, you get trade there. Mm. And eventually that city and that economic structure becomes more important mm. than the central government. Yeah. Because all these people are getting their money Employment from, you. from you. Yeah. And it basically destabilizes the country. So Channel is smart then. Channel is like, we're not going to play that game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, and so obviously some of this, you might think seem, seem kind of arrogant because it's like, well, look, 40 years from now, you know, the British are going to be blowing all this stuff up, but it's like, well, but that's an invasion. That's an invasion. Yeah. And also it's like, well, China as a country, Qianlong as an emperor, he doesn't owe the British anything, right? Like, yeah. and, and, and it's not, you know, if, if you invade a country that is not modernized, it's not necessarily the, the not modernized country's fault, mm. right? It's you, your fault for invading. But anyway, so. Well, that's a modern idea. I know. <laughs> so he says merchants need to be confined in Canton. Yeah. Because they do not follow laws and customs mm. and that it would cause, quote unquote, friction if they are among the Chinese people. Well, because, sounds like they did not follow local I know. laws so he's like, because of all these, quote unquote, irregularities. 
Yeah, and if you look at part of what actually eventually caused the Opium War is it's like the more contact there is between Chinese and Europeans, Mm -hmm. the more likely there could be an incident which will spark conflict, right? Yeah. You know, so he says, we trade with you. Although our celestial empire possesses all things in (laughs) prolific abundance and lacks no product within our borders, there is therefore no need to import the manufacturers of outside barbarians in exchange for our own produce. But as the tea, silk, and porcelain which the celestial empire produces are absolute necessities to the European nations and to yourselves, we have permitted as a single mark of our favor that foreign hongs, merchant firms, should be established at Canton so that your wants may be supplied and your country thus participate in our beneficence. <laughs> so he's like, we don't have to trade with you. We're just being nice. Yeah. Right? Which is a pity you that you don't have tea yeah. and you will die if you don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you should count your blessings. Um, they want an embassy in Beijing. Yeah. He's like, what's the point of an embassy in Beijing yeah. when it's 2,000 miles away from Canton? Yeah. You can only trade in Canton. Yeah. You know, what are you going to accomplish here? Just yeah. talk to the guy in Canton. <laughs> And so, you know, it kind of goes on like that, where he's basically like, for example, when, he, when uh, they want more ports, well, all the customs and all the agents and all the translators are already in Canton. Mm-hmm. None of these other ports have those people. And from the British point of view, it's like, well, exactly, because we don't want to deal with those people, right? <laughs> yeah. We, we would rather just be able to trade with anywhere. With China. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it kind of, I think, betrays the real goal is to, I think, make more money by essentially defying the the Qing controls on on yeah. commerce. Mm-hmm. They're not they're they're not in here to 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 help anyone into a cultural exchange, right? No, they're there to help themselves to make more money. Yes. So so with this rather disappointing result, so they most of the most of the crew goes back to the ships that are anchored off Tianjin mm. at the mouth of the river. But so many people have disease that McCartney doesn't want to go back with them on that ship. <laughs> so he gets permission from Tianlong to travel overland down the canals to Canton huh. and get on a different ship. Which well, again, isn't he nice to his people? Isn't he a nice guy? Such a great leader. Yeah. <laughs> so Chen Long is like, sure, you can go back. And also Aeneas, the, yeah. his valet, goes back with him. Right? Okay. So they basically travel all through central China, right? Yep. Which is you know, yeah. it's quite a trip. But he immediately, McCartney writes in his diary, can they be ignorant that a couple of English frigates would be an overmatch for their entire naval force of their empire? That in half a summer, they could totally destroy the navigation of their coasts and reduce the inhabitants of maritime provinces who subsist chiefly on fish to absolute famine. So he's basically like, what's the nerve of these people? Mm. We could just come in here and shoot them all, basically, right? We, yeah. could, we could raise the entire coast yeah. and they couldn't stop us, yeah. which is not really the attitude you have if you're, you're a diplomat, a diplomat <laughs> with a you know, friendly mission of trade. You go, oh, well, well, you know. No, he's well, like, but he's he, thinking of a... Of a what, what do you call the people who support the empire? Uh, as an imperi- not star Im- troopers, an imperialist, you know, yeah, imperialist, yeah. he's an imperialist. And that's yeah. how he think, you know. Yeah. But then he calms down because he's <laughs> yeah. thinking like, well, if we did that, they'd cut off the tea, and then we and then we'd be. <laughs> what in, are we gonna do without the tea? And then we'd be in real trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he says, our present interests, our reason, and our humanity equally forbid the thoughts of any offensive measures with regards to the Chinese, hmm. and while a ray of hope while a ray of hope remains for succeeding by gentle ones. But you know what? Let's just put that thought aside and in like another 40, 50 years, we'll, <laughs> yeah. we'll actually do it. Yeah, we'll actually yeah. do it. Just hold that thought, yeah. but don't forget about it. So that viewpoint would become less and less common as the yeah. decades wore on. Yes. So it is striking, though, that he writes in his journal, he's like, yeah, we could just kill these people. Yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess he didn't think the journal would be viewed in a different light. Yeah. Because, so, again, so, imperialist. I feel like Aeneas, so I want to have a couple thing again, because this is, again, a a journey which is sort of unique. You know, other people have been, you know, through China, but like, you know, the fact that they're there, the fact that they're honored guests, the fact that they're, um, you know. Not being, that honored, but I guess. Well, not by the end. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that they're being supported by all these people. Yeah. Um, you know, that he gets a very unfiltered view of the parts of China he can see. Yeah. And I think Aeneas is an interesting viewpoint, the the servant of Lord McCartney, because, you know, he seems like he doesn't really generalize. He describes like, oh, every different part of China they go to, the people dress differently, they have different customs. Mm, how yeah. forward thinking. Okay. I know. And I think he's an early abolitionist because mm. there's certain words he puts in the mouth of, of some Chinese that are like anti-slavery that seem 
like his own fairly developed for just some Chinese guy off the cuff (laughs) to talk about slavery. Right. Um, so, but you know, some, some minor observations. This is him on pastries. He says the Chinese possess the art of the Chinese, Oh, the Chinese possess the art of confectionery in a very superior degree, Mm. both as to its taste and the variety of its forms and colors. Their cakes of every kind are admirably made and more agreeable to the palate than any I remember to have tasted in England or any other country. Oh. Their pastry is also as light <laughs> of, as any I've eaten in Europe and in such prodigious variety as the combined efforts of the European confectioneries. confectioners, I believe, would not be able to produce. So he was troubled that there's no bread, quote unquote. He's like, damn, these Chinese but, desserts are pretty good. But you know what? The good. pastries, mm, yeah. very impressive. Pretty good. Um, Varieties. <laughs> I also think it's interesting. One of the gifts they get um, mm-hmm. are large parcels of the best tea of the country, made up in solid cakes in size and form of a Dutch cheese, like yeah, a wheel. Yeah, 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 yeah. A tea wheel. Yeah. Yeah, and he's like, it is in this in some way baked together, by which means it will be never affected by air or climate, nor ever lost its flavor, though kept without any covering whatsoever. Whatever. Each of these weighs about five pounds. Mm. I think it's interesting because it's like. They weren't getting the good stuff in Canton, right? Mm-hmm. That th- th- he's like, oh wow, they have this kind of tea, and I feel like it's basically like instant tea, right? Like you chip a little bit off and you yeah. do it. I, I mean, it's not instant; it's still tea leaves. So you oh, okay, give it, but it's just still, really compressed. I, it's just really, comp- it's just a way to tr- transport and store mm. them. And I, I think I'm not a tea expert, but I've always wanted to uh, try it. Try it myself okay. as well. well yeah. Maybe we should. Maybe we can get some. Um, so two other small observations. Mm-hmm. One is. The idea, so he spends some time at the end of his book talking about um, things other people have said about China. And he's like, I was just there. And he's like, a lot of this stuff is is BS. Mm. So apparently one of the things in Europe was that like, oh, Chinese women, it's like you never see them. They're all hidden, right? That, you mm. know, they never, they have no place in society, Yeah. all this stuff. And he's like, the idea which uh, people have propagated of the rigid confinement of Chinese women is equally void of truth. In different parts of that extensive country, different customs may prevail, and the power of husbands over their wives may be as such to render them masters of their liberty, which they may exercise with severity if circumstances... um, Basically, he's like, like, some places, yeah, they they could be like that. It's a big country. Yeah. He's like, but I do not hesitate to assert that women in general have a reasonable liberty in China and that there is the same communication and social intercourse with women which in Europe is considered a principal charm of social life. Hmm. So he's like, there's ladies around, like, come on. And then uh, last thing he says is that, and this kind of leads into the comment on, on women. Yeah. He says, in point of honesty, from um, he basically is like, everyone in China is really nice and honest. And he's like, the only place where they're not is Canton. He says... <laughs> He says they differ in point of honesty from the people of every other part of China where we had been, as in, at least as far as my means of observation would enable me to, to judge. Mm. Nor is it with less concern that I attribute this local character, which is knavish in the extreme, mm. to their being the inhabitants of the only place where there is any communication with the natives of other countries. Mm. So he's like, we've corrupted the people in Canton. Yeah. We've cheated them. We deal with them. So, like, so now they just have their guard up. <laughs> now they have their guard up. Yeah. Right. And they play tricks to us as we do to them. And probably that's also why, like, you know, you don't see women in that era because it's like they're not going to bring them out to see these barbarian foreigners. Mm. But he's like in other parts of China, it's not like that. Everybody's nice. Mm. Everybody's honest. Yeah. But, you know, it's just it's just Canton that's bad, <laughs> which, you know. So so that's the McCartney expedition. They eventually they reach Canton. They travel back. And um, McCartney gets made fun of um, for screwing it up, basically. Mm, I will say he deserves it, based on what I've heard today. And I think the, I think though the the reading of it of like, oh, these Chinese are so arrogant and so closed off and so superior. Um, well, he's reading of it. His reading of McCartney's reading of it. Mm. I think eventually became more and more prevalent, mm. and and partially leads to the ideas that had the opium war where it's like these people are so backwards the only way they're ever going to advance as a people is if we barge in there with guns yeah and that takes over the older view of china as almost like this perfect celestial kingdom yeah that 
they do things differently. Dragon in the East. Where it, the yeah. idea is like they do things differently than we do them in Europe. Yeah. But maybe they do them better. Yeah. Right? They've been around a long time. They have all this wealth, all these things. Yeah. Maybe we could learn something from them. And then, you know, the McCartney expedition, you know, I think McCartney basically screwed it up. They might not have gotten all that stuff they wanted anyway. They probably wouldn't have. But, you know, after this point, it's going to be a more and more adversarial relationship. Yeah. Because instead of looking at what they might have done wrong or looking at how better to engage with this Qing court, which obviously has its problems, they're just like, how can we bypass it? How can we get around them? How can we break these rules? Yeah. And that's going to kind of be the, the theme for the next hundred years. Yeah. Which is rather depressing. It's, I mean, even today, though, there's still this um, seemingly con- uh, contradicting view mm-hmm. of like what China is, right? Or, or the history of China, right? Yeah. 5,000 years, or this is that, you know, culture, tradition, Confucius. And mm-hmm. then at the same time, it's a, it's a country, they think it's a country without culture, it's communism, it's, you know. Well, I, I I do think it's it's interesting because there is like a break yeah. in the perception. And it's like it's almost like you're playing a video game and like a tech becomes obsolete. Yeah. Because it's like obviously people look, they talk about like, you know, I don't know, like the reign of like Emperor Kangxi. Like, you know, they talk about like the high points of dynasties. Yeah. And they go, oh, Chinese culture was so great. Confucianism, all these things. Yeah. But then whenever things are bad, there's a tendency. <laughs> yeah. As soon as things get bad, there's a tendency to blame it. Yes. As if like, oh, now suddenly. Yeah. Suddenly it's all garbage. Right. But it's and, not black and white. No, it's like not. Like nothing bl- ever is. Yeah. And a few things are. And the issues that are going to coincide with the opium war and other things, which we're going to talk about during the during the century of shame, as it's put, you know, like it's really it's really a combination of. You have a a weakening imperial dynasty. At the yeah. same time, you have all these other people. You have another imperial power that's growing. That's and nipping expanding at. And, yeah, nipping at. And them. has a big appetite. Yeah, and I think that it's quite possible that if there was a stronger, you know, imperial system at the time, like for example, with you know, then in China. Yeah, in China like during these time periods, or, or you know, things might have looked different. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. Um. So. Because I it's think a, it's a tug of war that happens on both ends. Yeah, I mean, it would have been a yeah. rough century probably for because for, because China is perfectly ha- capable of having some bad decades and some bad centuries with no foreign involvement. Oh, ourselves, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, you have rebellions, you have different things, and um, yeah, just count how many dynasties has gone. Yeah, come and come and went. Yeah. yeah, and so the unfortunate thing is, Chen Long, I think, is probably considered the last really good. Qing emperor, right? Successful. 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 Not as good as Kangxi, who's before him. Yeah. Um, but the emperors are going to get progressively worse. Mm-hmm. And there's going to be a lot of economic and social problems that have nothing to do with trade. Yeah. That are going to happen internally. Happen internally. Yeah. That's going to coincide now with all these foreigners in this post-McCartney expedition world. Yes. Just trying to take stuff with a gun. Yes. Well, hopefully that was interesting to people. It was to me. And I want to thank everybody for listening, even that one person who gave us a three out of five <laughs> review on Apple we got Podcasts. One new, we got a new review, and it was three stars, and all the other reviews are five stars it's okay. um, by family and friends. I don't everyone's know. I have no allowed, idea, but everyone's th- allowed I was to, like, who gave us a three star? Everyone's allowed <laughs> to have an opinion. Yeah. Well, uh, we still appreciate you um, if you made it to here. Um, if you would like to support us, you know, give us a review. However many stars you want, an Apple podcast, recommend us to your friends and family, whoever you might think, you know, is interested in Chinese history and politics and Asian American history and politics. And uh, this is the first episode of season three. And we are back for another season. And uh, yeah, another, I don't know, 15, 20 episodes or. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We got some good ones lined up, I think. And thank you for sticking with us through the pandemic that hopefully, fingers crossed, is almost over. And um, we'll see you next time. Have a nice day.